Church, how are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you are with us as well. And happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. So when I was in sixth grade, our family lived in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was the week before Christmas, my sixth grade year. And it was uh, a Sunday night, and our family was having dinner at a friend's house, another family's house. And at the end of the evening, as we were getting ready to leave, my parents said, hey, what if we were to go home now? and open up all your Christmas presents, right? A week before Christmas. And my brothers and I go, yeah, right. There's no way that you will let us do that. My parents were super strict about Christmas presents. If we even so much as touched them while they were under the tree, she's like, I'm sending them all back. If you look at them wrong, they are going to be gone. Super serious about Christmas presents. So we didn't believe that they were being serious, but after a while, they're so adamant, like, like, oh, they... They are serious. So a week before Christmas, at 8 p.m. on that Sunday night, we went home and we tore through all of our gifts and it was so much fun. But then we got to the end and we're like, but what are we going to do on Christmas morning? Like we had that realization like, did we just ruin Christmas? And we're staring at our parents like, why did you let us do this? And they said, well, there's actually one more gift. Tomorrow morning, we're going to leave and we're going to go to Disneyland for the week. And we're all like, yeah. Amazing. So for the week of Christmas, we went to SeaWorld and we went to Disneyland and we had a great time. And the day we were at Disneyland, like we did, we did all the things. Like we did Space Mountain and Splash Mountain, did the Star Wars ride, Pirates of the Caribbean ride, the, you know, the, the, the big, like, I don't know what it is, ride with like the, the globe in it. Maybe that is Space Mountain. Anyway, we had a great day. Ate at a restaurant and I got like this big turkey leg and just ate it like I was like, oh, a real manly man. And in my sixth grade mind, the completion to the day, the thing that would have made the day amazing and I was expecting we were going to do was ride the Thunder Mountain ride. Like in my mind, that was like an iconic ride, like it kind of was going to seal the deal of my Disney experience. So we're winding down, it's late at night, and I'm like ready to go, and my parents are like, we are going to go. Not to Thunder Mountain, we are leaving the park, we are done for the day. I'm like, what do you mean we're done for the day? Like, they're exhausted. My brother, my younger brother was in third grade. He was, like, toast. And they're like, Brian, like, we, we just don't have it in us to go stand in line for another ride, to ride. Like, we are going to be done. And I was, I was livid. I mean, I was so mad. Like, I was like, what do you mean? Like, you have just ruined Christmas. Like, how can you bring me to Disneyland, not take me to Thunder Mountain, and think that you are good parents? What is wrong with you? And they... And they were adamant. We left Disneyland. I have, to this day, never rode Thunder Mountain. And I think my life is lesser for it. <laughs> now, the irony of this is over spring break this year, I had a similar experience with my own kids. We were down in Atlanta for a few days uh, visiting some friends. And then on our way home, we decided to go through St. Louis and spend a few days in St. Louis. The plan, we actually had one full day in St. Louis, and the plan was to go to the zoo, go to the city museum, and then go visit the arch. Now, in my mind, I was thinking, like, we'll get to St. Louis, day of, I'll go online and buy all the tickets that I need to buy for the day. Bought tickets for the city museum, no problem. The zoo's free, no problem. Went to go buy tickets for the arch, and they were all sold out. I was like, really? Is the arch that popular of an attraction? So I told the kids, I'm like, hey, here's the deal. We won't get to ride the arch, but we will go walk around. We'll look at the museum. We'll, we'll do it all, whatever we can there, but except go up it. And they're like, okay, that's great. So we go to the, the zoo, had a great time. We went to the city, the city museum, which you've, if you've ever been to the city museum, super cool, but it was swamped. I think actually half of Tosa was in St. Louis at the city museum. We ran into so many Tosa people there It was wild, but it was so packed, so crazy, so chaotic. We left at like 4.30, and Becky and I were wiped and overstimulated. We were planning to go to dinner, and we're like, we probably need a little downtime for dinner. And so I told our girls, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to go drive by the arch, and we're just going to go look at it from the car. And one daughter was like, what do you mean? Like, we're going to go, we were going to the arch. We're just not going to get out and go walk around. She's like, that's not what you told me earlier. And I was like, I know. But there are times in life when we don't get what we want. And the way that I was mad when I was in sixth grade, this child of mine was 
equally mad that day. Dad, you're ruining spring break. You're a terrible parent. I can't believe this is happening. And so I thought, hey, this is a great moment to teach my daughter some empathy. And so I said to her, hey, you know, when I was in sixth grade, I had a similar experience at Disneyland and Thunder Mountain, thinking that she'd be like, Dad, I feel your pain. I get it. And she just goes, see, all the more reason you should take me to the arch now. You're ruining my childhood. And I was like, oh, bad parenting move all the way around. But the question is for us this morning is what do you do when you don't get what you want? What do you do when you don't get what you want? Now, that reality isn't only true on family trips and family vacations. It's also true in our spiritual life. It's also true in our relationship with Jesus because many of us at times go to Jesus with the expectation of receiving something and we don't always get what we want. I wonder if anybody here has ever prayed for somebody to be healed and that person was not healed. I wonder if anybody here this morning has prayed for God to restore an estranged relationship, but that relationship is still distant and difficult. There are times when we go to Jesus hoping for something, and we don't get what we want. And so the question is, even in our spiritual life, what do we do when we don't get what we want? At the end of chapter 6, there are a group of people who are sitting in that reality. They have come to Jesus hoping for one thing, and the results don't turn out the way that they expect. And the question is for them, what are they going to do when they go to Jesus and they don't get what they want? So we're going to start kind of at the beginning of chapter 6 again, because in order to understand the end of chapter 6 really well, you have to kind of be reminded of what came before it. And chapter 6 begins in verse 1 this way. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Now, John records two of those signs. At the end of chapter 4, Jesus heals an official son who is at home, distant from Jesus. Jesus just speaks a word, and this man's son is healed. Then at the beginning of chapter 5, he heals a man, a paralyzed man, who is laying by a pool. And there are a few times in John's gospel, John alludes to Jesus is doing more than just those two signs. You have at the end of chapter 2, and then here at the beginning of chapter 6, we have two recorded, but it seems as though Jesus was doing a lot of this work, the way John sets it up, that he's healing lots and lots of sick people. And so what we see is that the hype around Jesus is high. The hype around Jesus is high. He's healing the sick, sometimes who are distant and far removed from him, and he just speaks the word, and instantly they are healed. And so in this moment, we're told that 5,000 men are in this moment with Jesus at the beginning of chapter 6. Now, it's thought that that's just the men recorded. Then there's women and children, so it's thought that there could be as many as 10 to 15,000 people crowding around Jesus, which would be equivalent to a packed house at the Panther Arena downtown. A huge crowd is there. And hype is fun. The hype around Jesus is high. And hype is fun. It's exciting. It's entertaining. And then when hype is high people follow. When the hype is high, people follow. I mean, this happened to me just this spring, because if there is one sports figure over the last six months who has been hyped up more than anybody else, it's Caitlin Clark. Anybody a Caitlin Clark play? It's like so hard not to be a fan of Caitlin Clark. Right, springtime, she did something amazing. She broke the all-time scoring record in NCAA basketball. It was a 54-year-old record held by Pistol Pete, who played for LSU. He scored 3,667 points. She scored 3,951 points. She broke a record not just for women's basketball, but for men's and women's basketball. 
I mean, going into March Madness, Caitlin Clark was the leading story everywhere because she's chasing a championship. She's won the Big Ten championship. She broke this record. Can she get a national championship? And what was so crazy that they didn't win, but what was so incredible was that the women's NCAA championship game had a higher viewer rating than the men's championship game. By 4 million people, the men's game had like 14 million, the ladies' game had 18 million. Just people are tuned in to see what she's going to do. A a few days after the NCAA championship game, she rolls into the WNBA draft. And people are anticipating she's going to go number one, she's going to get drafted by the Indiana Fever. And the viewership of the WNBA draft, people think because of her, from one year to the next, increased by 400%. It was about a half a million the year before. This year, two and a half million people tuned in to watch her get chosen number one. She's revolutionizing women's basketball, and there's all kinds of hype around her. And the question that's looming for Caitlin Clark as she goes into the WNBA is, what will she do next? Like, what barriers is she going to break next? And there's all this hype. And I hopped on the bandwagon. If you go through my social media feed, you'll find like all these Caitlin Clark videos popping up of interviews of how she likes her mom's chocolate chip cookies after games and what her pregame routine is like. I've just been dialed in like she's a fascinating figure. When the hype is high, people follow and wonder what will happen next. That's the exact same question that people are wondering about Jesus. What will Jesus do next? Because he's already healing the sick. There's got to be more that this guy can do. And this crowd is forming to see what that is. Now, we're not told in this moment that Jesus actually heals people, but it wouldn't surprise me if he did. What we are told that he does in this moment is he feeds this massive crowd miraculously. He puts on a miraculous all-you-can-eat buffet for 15,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Everybody ate as much as they they wanted. They were satisfied. They were full. There was even leftovers. People could take home a doggy bag, and people are like, mind-blowing. Who is this guy? And what happens in this moment is they start to form their perception of who Jesus is. And the perception begins with Jesus as a miracle worker because he's healing the sick and He's providing free food for everybody and in a miraculous way, but he's also a prophet because at the end of that episode where Jesus feeds everybody, the crowds think, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. That's John 6 verse 14. And then we're told in verse 15 that they are ready to make him king. They see Jesus as a miracle worker, a prophet, and a potential king. I mean, if he can do that, with fish and bread. Like, what else could he do with a whole empire? And then the last perception that they have is that Jesus could be their sugar daddy, that Jesus could be the guy who continually doles out goodies to the crowd when they need and want. Because here's what happens next in this story. Jesus knows that they're perceiving this, that they want to make him king, it says, by force. So he slips away and actually tries to get away from the crowds. Now, it rolls around to the next day, and these crowds realize that Jesus has left. He's actually around the Sea of Galilee. He gets in a boat. He goes from this side of the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And when they wake up the next morning and they realize he's not here, they go looking for him. They cross the lake. They cross the Sea of Galilee to find Jesus. And then they find him on the other side, and they kind of play it off like it's happenstance. They're like, oh, Jesus. This is verse 25. Oh, Jesus, when did you get here? We didn't know you were going to be here. Isn't this so crazy that we're bumping into you again? Now, Jesus sees right through their motivation. Like, he sees exactly what they're doing. And he says, you're after me not because of the signs that you've seen, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. And then he goes on to say, don't work for food that spoils, 
but for food that endures to eternal life. Jesus is so calculated, and he's starting to call them in, and he knows exactly what he's doing. He's drawing them in, playing off their motivation, getting them to be all excited. Okay, okay, well, what is the work, they ask, that we must do that God requires? If you're going to say do work to please God, what's that work? We'll do it as long as more bread is at the end of that train. And Jesus says, believe in the one God has sent. And then they go on to say, okay, okay, okay. So what sign will you do that we might see and believe as though they forgot about the miraculous buffet that they had just the day before? And then they have the audacity to suggest what Jesus should do. Hey, Jesus, you know, When our ancestors wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, way back when, God miraculously, through Moses, provided this miracle bread from heaven. If you can do that, they're saying, then we will believe. And Jesus goes on to say, well, it wasn't really Moses who did that, but it was my Father in heaven. And my Father in heaven actually has better bread, better bread from heaven then he gave to your ancestors. He has better bread. And they say in response, give us this bread always. They're still thinking about physical bread. Jesus is starting to talk about spiritual things. They're thinking about physical things. And it reminds me of this picture I've seen of Pluto, right, who's like salivating. He's got eyes wide open, like, give us this bread, please. Because here's the other thing. When the hype is high, not only do people follow? But when the hype is high, crowds also consume. They consume. Go back to Caitlin Clark. Draft night, just this past spring, she gets drafted number one. Everybody's over the moon, excited, knew it was going to happen, but it's so cool. That night, she ended up setting another record. She wasn't even playing basketball, and she's setting records. She set a record that night for the most jersey sales of any draft pick ever across any sport, men's and women's combined. People jumped on the Caitlin Clark bandwagon even more and just bought up all of the Indiana Fever jerseys with number 22 on the front and Caitlin Clark on the back. Like, people just instantly, boom, consume all that they can. When the hype is high, people follow. When the hype is high, crowds consume, and that's exactly what's happening here. This crowd is hyped up on Jesus, and they're looking to consume as much as they can from Him. But Jesus' response in this moment is to be disruptive to their sensibilities. And, and, and not just for the sake of stirring the pot and trying to be controversial, but he's disruptive trying to get their attention. Because again, he says, my father has better bread than Moses gave to your ancestors. And their response is, give us this bread always. And then Jesus says, I am the bread. I am the bread that you're after, and this confuses them more than they could ever anticipate. They're like, wait, what? What is he talking about? Like, he's saying he came from heaven? This is Jesus of Nazareth, who we know. We saw him as a young boy growing up. He's the son of Mary and Joseph. We know who he is. He has not come from heaven. What in the world is he talking about? He confuses them with this statement, and then he takes it to a whole nother level. And this is where we're at in our passage today, verse 53. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Between verse 53 and verse 58, Jesus will say five times successively, boom, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Feed on me. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Feed on me. And the crowds are like, whoa, like, whoa, what in the world is he talking about? Now, 
Some scholars think that what Jesus is doing here is actually pointing towards the Lord's Supper. I mean, we celebrate the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis. We say that this is the bread, this bread is the body of Christ broken for you. This cup is the blood of Christ shed for you. So some scholars think Jesus is pointing to the Lord's Supper. But at that time, the Lord's Supper had not been instated yet. Now, John is writing years after Jesus' life. So John could be pointing back to the Lord's Supper. But if in the moment, these are the actual words of Jesus, those listening to his words in real time would have no category of anything around the Lord's Supper. What they would be hearing is cannibalistic language about feeding on Jesus, and they have no idea what to do with it. Now, while it's graphic language, the thing that Jesus is doing here is he's trying to use a metaphor around belief. Because all through chapter 6, repeatedly, Jesus says, believe in the one he has sent. Believe in the Son of Man. The word believe, I mean, it's repeated all throughout John's gospel, but specifically in chapter 6, believe in the one he has sent, namely Jesus. Now, sometimes we think belief is intellectual agreement about some facts, some story, or something that happened long ago. Belief includes intellectually understanding something, but belief in Jesus' language is more about aligning your life with Him. It's more about allegiance. It's more about seeing Him as the most important person in your life and ordering your life accordingly. Belief isn't just about agreeing with something, it's aligning your life with a new reality. And so simultaneously, Jesus is calling them to believe, but also being disruptive, and he's being disruptive around two things. One, he's being disruptive around their pursuit, the pursuit of their desire for another free meal. Jesus is my sugar daddy. He did that once. He's going to do it again. All they want is another free meal. The other thing that he's disrupting is their perception, namely their perception of him. Because what they perceive, how they perceive Jesus is simply around what he can do for me, and the more he does for me, the more I'm inclined to follow him. And really what he's trying to do is he's trying to expose those who are simply fans, who are just following the hype, versus those who are true followers of him, even when they don't get what they want. Because fans are interested in what Jesus can do for them. As a pastor, sometimes we see that. Sometimes we see people wander into our church because they're in a place of confusion, like they need wisdom, they need guidance, they're not sure why life is turning out the way that it is, and they need massive help because they are confused about some reality. Or they have some sort of concern. Maybe it's a health concern. Maybe they're concerned about one of their kids, and they don't know what to do. They're at their wit's end. And so because of their concern, they come and they show up here, and they're like, we need help. Sometimes people show up and they're in crisis, all kinds of crisis, financial crisis, relational crisis, health crisis. I mean, crisis all around them, and they're like, I don't know what to do. Now, that's not bad. Like, Jesus meets people where they are. He's happy to meet you in a place of confusion, concern, or crisis, but oftentimes what we see is that when the confusion is over, the concern is gone, the crisis has been resolved, People go on their merry way, and we don't see them again. They're always welcome back. Jesus will always welcome people back with open arms every time. But what he's really after is people who follow him, not based on what he does for them, but based on who he really is. Because what he's saying to the crowds at this moment, he's saying, hey, I'm not a circus monkey who does bread tricks for you right? I'm not a miracle worker 
at your beck and call. He's trying to get the people in this moment to see, I'm Lord of the universe. I hold all things together in the palm of my hand. I speak and things happen. I could make bread rain from heaven right now if I wanted. I have the power to do that. But I'm not in service of you. I'm calling you to follow me. So the question is, what do you do when you don't get what you want? What do these crowds do when they don't get what they want? Verse 41, at this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They start to grumble and complain. Who does this guy think he is? Has Jesus totally lost his mind? We know who he is. How can he say he's come down from heaven? And not only do they grumble, they start to argue with one another. Verse 52, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, the natural response when you don't get what you want is to grumble, complain, and argue. My sixth grade self, put that on full display as my parents marched me out the exit of Disneyland, stomping and complaining, I just want to ride Thunder Mountain, right? You argue, you complain when you don't get what you want. I mean, truthfully, sometimes I still do that at age 42, right? It's not just sixth graders who do that. There's plenty of you here this morning who do the exact same thing. You just do it in a more grown-up way, right? We grumble, we complain, we argue when we don't get what we want, And notice here that what Jesus is doing, it's not just the crowds who are reacting in this way. Because we're told in verse 41 that the Jews were doing this. We're told in verse 52 that the Jews were arguing. Jesus is starting to make a distinction about groups of people who are here in this moment. There are the crowds who in those two verses he represents by the Jews, but then he starts to speak to his own and speak about his own disciples, verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? See, when the hype is high, Jesus' teaching gets hard because Jesus is trying to distinguish who's really after him for who he is, not just what he can do for them. Verse 61, aware that his disciples, right, here it is, aware that his disciples were grumbling They're doing the same things that the crowds were doing. Jesus doesn't back down. He said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. See, not only in response do they grumble, not only do they argue, but the crowds and his so-called disciples abandon him. They leave him. They're like, this is too hard. This is too awkward. I'm not going to go chomp on Jesus. I'm out. Thanks, but no thanks. Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so again, Jesus is making distinctions about who is there. He speaks to the crowds. They're like, oh, this is too much. He speaks to some of his would-be disciples. They also are like, ah, I can't take it anymore. And then it says he turns to the 12, the specific men that he called by name to follow him. Verse 67, do you want to leave too? Do you? Jesus asked the 12. Another distinction, again, who's there? But then Simon Peter said this in verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, that might sound like what Peter is saying is, hey, we're just after something as well. We just want eternal life. We know that you have eternal life. You're the one who's guiding us to it. So we're after you so that we can get eternal life. But then he goes on to say something else. He goes on to say, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. See, he speaks 
not just to what Jesus can do for them, but He speaks to who Jesus is. He speaks to His identity, which means what John is trying to do in this moment is show that the holiness of Jesus is greater than the hype. The holiness of Jesus is greater than the hype. Now, sometimes we think of holiness in terms of morality. We are holy people. If we, are getting, if we have our act together, if we're on our best behavior, we sometimes equate holiness with morality, which isn't necessarily the case. Not that we should go be immoral people. But when the, the Scriptures talk about holy, it's talking about something that's set apart, something that is distinct, something that is unique, and there is nothing else like it in the world and that's who Jesus is. Jesus is different than any other so-called God out there. Jesus is different than any other prophet who has come before him. Jesus is different than any wise sage or moral teacher. Jesus is in a category all of his own. Everything else in the world pales in comparison to him. I, I said it last year. Um, been watching The Chosen, and we're watching it again with our kids. And every time I watch Jesus in The Chosen, I'm like, I love this guy. Absolutely love him. I have a huge man crush on Jesus because the way they portray him is like nothing else. And then I have to remind myself, he's even better than the way they portray him. Jesus is in a category all to himself. His holiness is better than the hype. You could say it this way, another way, that who Jesus is is better than what he gives. Now, sometimes those two things are linked together. But if we're only after Jesus for what he can do for me, we miss the best part of him, and that's who he is. The relationship that we have available to us because of his sacrificial death, because he's wiped our sins away, because he is in the process of making all things new, we have access not to just the stuff of the kingdom, but the king of the kingdom, who is king. He's just a different sort of king than most people perceive. So the question for us this morning is, what is your perception of Jesus? How do you perceive him? And the way you know is all based on how, when, and why you approach him. Is it just so he can do something for you? Is it just so he can give you encouragement and wisdom and guide us? Again, those things aren't bad, and he's happy to do it. But if we only go to Jesus when we need something from him, we miss the greater reality of always being in relationship with him. So what is your perception of him? Why are you pursuing him? Is it to get something from him, or is it just to get him. So may you see that Jesus is better than what he gives. May you see that his holiness and his uniqueness is better than all the hype. And may you see that he is the true bread from heaven who has come to give life to the world. God, we are so grateful that you have given yourself for us. We are so grateful that you are a God who is full of compassion, who is slow to anger, who's abounding in love, who gives us everything we need right when we need it, who has given all of yourself through your death for us, that by the power of your resurrection, you are making all things new, and you have given that power and that authority to us. And so, Lord, we ask that we would rest in that, that we would see all that you have done for us, and we would continue to see you for who you really are. And may we give our whole life to you. Amen.